Well, hello, welcome to the video. This one's about the lost heroes of the pub rock movement. People that you might not know existed, even though they had huge influence and were very... I don't know what the word is, but there's a word for it. And here's the countdown clock. So let's just start. Let's just raise our glasses to Mickey Job. people think that Mickey Jope and Wicko Johnson said this was the inspiration behind Dr. Feelgood and indeed he was like the big cheese of the local Canvey South End music scene. He formed a band called Legend that were like on the verge of making it when he packed it in because this is the thing about Mickey Jope I put him on many times in the early days I, when I was at the John Bull at Chiswick and then later at the Green Man in Stratford with my friend Steve Rundle and Mickey by this time had a reputation for being a bit prickly shall we say he wasn't the easiest man to get on with but we always got on fine and then eventually he just like refused to play most of the London gig circuit and only played for a man called Steve Beggs who maybe one day I'll do a piece about Steve because he was a pioneer he was one of the early people at the Dublin Castle and he did Sundays at the 100 Club and he lost an absolute fortune he lost his flat and his house and everything put it on show Mickey Jupp was really, really good. He was a great songwriter, he was a pianist, a guitarist, a singer, like one of the best. I mean, he was like in the realm of Dr. John and Bo Diddley and Chuck Berry and people like that. So I would think that if Mickey Jupp had put a bit more effort in and got the right chances, he would have been up there now with, I mean, when you think that people like Phil Collins and Rod Stewart made millions out of the music industry and something like Mickey Jupp didn't, well, you think there's something wrong, don't you? Well, I do, anyway. So who's number two? Before we get to number two, if you like this, please like, comment, let me know what you think, and subscribe, and let's get on with it. So who's number two? It's gotta be Eggs Over Easy. Put a bar in the back of my car, I'll drive myself to jail. Yeah, I'm gonna put a little bar in the back of my car. Now, if you go along with the school of thought which I, th I believe now I've been told it's the Dave Robinson of Stiff Records school of thought at the Tally Ho when Eggs Over Easy got a residency and they weren't a jazz band because that's the first time apparently this is the legend to refer back to the Mickey Jupp band but I don't necessarily think because I think there were always gigs in pubs in London but I th agree that it was accelerated when Eggs Over Easy who were an American band who were over in London to do some work here and try and make it big here Nick Lowe called them a human jukebox because in their set they apparently had low, was it 200 songs, something like that. And this is the sort of thing that they used to do. I don't care if you are high, I don't even wonder why. All I care about is not in the Now, even though I saw eggs over easy once or twice in those early days. I was never a big fan. It was never my type of music. I always thought that Brindley Schwartz, for example, did what they did a lot better. It's a matter of taste, isn't it? But they were very influential and I can't believe that they're not better known now, actually. But there you go. This is why they're one of the unknown greats of pub rock. And who's the third, you ask? Well, Recently, a man called John Eichler, who was the landlord of the Hope and Anchor from about 76 onwards, during the golden days, shall we say, of the Hope and Anchor, he recently died, sadly. Now, he was, like, influential in so many ways. He was a friend to the band as, as much as a manager of a live music venue. Because the Hope and Anchor was always on the verge of going bust, he organised the famous Front Row Festival, which featured so many great pub rock icons, all of whom had played at the Hope and Anchor. There's lots of stories about him. He was one of the people on the Bringley Schwartz ill-fated trip to the United States in 1972, I think it was. Help Yourself was formed by John Eichler, who was a backing band for Malcolm Morley, who had recently left Man. They, were, they weren't really that influential, to be honest, yeah, but I added them because of the John Eichler connection. But interestingly enough, I noticed that when they reformed in the early part of this century, one of the members was Kevin Spacey on drums. I wonder if that's the same one. Well, who knows? And who's the next band? Well, Burlesque. 
No, not blessed by family. A band. I got me, babe. I got me, babe. Yes, burlesque. The day we're always in the running. I went to see burlesque at the Nashville a few times and it's always quite packed. And the two key members, Ian Trimmer and Billy Jenkins. And I later, when burlesque broke up, Ian and Billy formed a duo, which is mainly comedy music called Trimmer and Jenkins. And they um, went off to do stuff and they did an album for Charisma, well, at least one, because there's a live album and somewhere my name's on that somewhere. This was back in, I don't know, 1980. But before then, burlesque were quite a big force on the pub rock circuit. Here's an interesting sidebar about burlesque. For the launch of their 1977 debut album, which I believe was called Acupuncture, they had a launch at the Zanzibar Club and um, people turned up, all the journalists and things. I never went to anything like that, never invited. All the journalists turned up and the band weren't there and nobody could work out what was going on. And um, all the way through, there was background music being played by a band that announced themselves as the Arnold Benjamin Sextet, but unfortunately Arnold was indisposed. And it was in disguise, burlesque, and nobody knew. And they never quite made it, and I never know why, because I thought that they should. But anyway, I think perhaps... Billy got fed up, because I know he got fed up of Trimwin Jenkins because he said he felt like a performing monkey. And last time I saw him, he was performing, not performing, what's the word? He was officiating at um, funerals. So that's a bit of a change of direction. And also he managed a rehearsal studio for a very long time. There you go, that's burlesque. A simple life is all I need To shatter fantasy and want any trouble were formed at Crew and El Sega College. Um, the key member all the way through was a guy called Clive Gregson, who played on a guitar and sang and wrote most of the songs. Now, I knew Clive Gregson when he was in a duo with Christine Collister, which I put on quite a lot in the 80s at the Cricketers. But before then, basically, Any Trouble started as a covers band doing mainly Bob Dylan style stuff. And that was reflected in their music. What happened was they had a, a vo originally had a vocalist, I think called Tom, I can't remember his surname, sorry. He left and Clive took over. He was playing the rhythm guitar and he was, um, doing the vocals. Again, they were a very exciting, very... You only see them, there's something there that you couldn't quite put your finger on. It was more than the sum parts of the songs and the performance. And I always thought they'd make it huge, but they never did. I wonder why. The Fabulous Poodles formed in 1975 and they toured with everybody. They backed Chuck Berry and they toured with people like Meatloaf. I can't remember exactly who, but they were, again, everybody thought this is the biggest band <laughs> this is going to be. They were so huge and they, I saw them at Nashville and places like that. The key people in the band were Tony Demure, who was the lead singer and main songwriter. There was Richie Robertson on bass and Bobby Valentino, unusually, who played the fiddle. Those were the three main people. The Fabulous Poodles, who were like John Peel's favourite band for a while. This is really the pre-punk John Peel. And let's not talk about John Peel. No one could understand why they didn't make it and I suppose it was the punk thing they weren't really punk and I think that the punk thing overshadowed everything else and they weren't persistently enough like a lot of bands to keep on going and push through because by about the, the early 80s of course punk was like past in a way and a lot of the punk bands had like developed their own style and unfortunately the family spoodles were gone ronnie golden who is tony demure who is the front man became a stand-up comedian and musician and i put his um band ronnie and the rex on once or twice so i actually uh spent several years in nam top nam does anyone know and in the early 80s they do like um alternative comedy shows in the early days of that. We picked like Alexi Sale and Tony Allen and Keith Allen. Bobby Valentino went on and he was on a few hits. He was the fiddle player on um, the Bluebells hits and he actually famously went to court and sued them and won. <laughs> Where you go. So thank you for watching. You might have noticed that I did five and a half, but that's not a bad thing, is it? So um, thank you for watching, and I'll see you next time. And also, I've got lots of these sort of things out if you want to watch them. They're all on YouTube. Get watching. Thank you.